Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of eStewards version 4.1, where we'll cover an overview of the changes as well as the transition requirements as presented by eStewards. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS program manager with Perry Johnson Registrars. I have a brief agenda on this, this first slide. We'll cover very briefly a little bit about PJR, who we are, what we do. We'll also, again, briefly cover the benefits of certification for a standard like eStewards for anyone who is less familiar or pursuing registration for the first time. We will cover both the transition details and the key changes in version 4.1 compared to version 4.0 for those current eStewards uh, certified clients who will be preparing to transition in the near future. And we will close with any questions that you may have. So feel free to type those into the question or chat field at any point throughout the presentation. I will save those for the end. And just to get one question out of the way, today's webinar is being recorded so that a copy of the presentation as well as copies of the slides can be posted to PJR's website. The individual who typically does that activity is on vacation, so there may be a longer than usual delay on those if you'd like to email me after the presentation or after the webinar. I can send you a copy of those materials uh, or at least the slides in the meantime. Perry Johnson Registrars is one of the leading certification bodies. We have certified clients to a variety of standards around the globe. It's certainly not an all-inclusive list of countries in which we've certified clients, but it does give you an idea of our global presence as a CB. PJR is accredited to grant certifications, as I mentioned, for a wide variety of standards, including eStewards, which is what we are discussing today. If you are currently eStewards certified, I suspect you're already familiar with some of the benefits to certification, but for anyone interested in pursuing certification for the first time, I will cover these briefly. The standard itself represents a commitment to preventing irresponsible or illegal handling of specific waste streams, so hazardous waste or electronic waste. Um, this includes data security concerns, the concept of social responsibility, and it also extends to the concept of environmental conservation or protection efforts. So being able to advertise eSteward certification is the same or kind of goes hand in hand with being able to advertise what the standard itself stands for or represents. In implementing and maintaining a certification to eStewards, you are working to reduce environmental, occupational health and safety, data security, and social accountability risks since the eStewards standard has a scope inclusive of all of those factors or risk categories. There are other business management drivers or benefits, including improving public image. Again, being able to advertise this certification is held. Being able to advertise, again, what the standard represents. So responsibly managing the electronics and the electronic components is part of the benefit of certification. Being able to advertise this, being able to uh, convey that you hold this specific certification can provide a competitive advantage. If your key competitors don't hold the eSteward certification or a similar certification, that can certainly make you stand out during the bidding process. <clears throat> the standard itself represents a framework for maintaining compliance with both customer and regulatory requirements and this would include the Basel Convention. E 
eStewards version 4.1 was actually published in February. I've included some links for anyone who wants to access the copies of the slides themselves to be able to have functioning hyperlinks to the standard, the sanctioned interpretations, the transition plan so that you can obtain copies yourselves. So there is both a standalone version of this of the revised standard of version 4.1 but there's also a copy or a version with all of the changes highlighted so i've included a link to that particular version here i've also included links to the sanctioned interpretations which are meant to be utilized in conjunction with the standard so eStewards has published two versions um, parts a and b and I've included, again, those hyperlinks here. eStewards also published a transition plan that was more recent, uh, mid-March, that came out. So you can find a copy of the transition plan following the hyperlink as well, and we will go through some of those details on the next slides. eStewards transition plan indicates that audits scheduled between the date of publication and April 22nd can be conducted to either version of the standard. So this would be up to the client. If they feel ready to transition early, they may do so. When we are talking about initial registrations or recertification audits falling within that date range, specifically, if the client decides to have their audit be conducted to version 4.1, the expiration for that certificate once issued would be reflective of the overall deadline to transition, which we will talk about. So those will expire um, in less than three years since you'll be due to transition. By April 22nd of this year, the eStewards transition plan expects existing eStewards clients to have implemented the new sanctioned interpretations and to have identified measures to implement the version 4.1 changes. All audits scheduled after April 22nd, so beginning on or after April 23rd, do need to be conducted to version 4.1. That will no longer be optional. Continuing with the transition requirements, these can occur on site or virtually if the client's a good candidate. It doesn't necessarily need to be an on-site audit. They can occur during surveillance or recertification audits as well, based on where your audit falls within the cycle. As always, PGR reserves the right to add audit time to a transition audit if it's being conducted during a surveillance audit to make sure all of the changes are adequately audited. The overall deadline to transition is April 22nd of 2023. So at that point, any remaining version 4.0 certificates will be withdrawn. You need to plan accordingly as you prepare to transition. PGR has an internal deadline recommendation of February 1st, 2023, in order to prevent a lapse in certification. What I mean by that is there are a number of activities that take place after the audit concludes. So it wouldn't be enough to have your audit finish on April 21st, for example, because any NCRs that result from the audit need to be closed. The package then goes through a technical review process by an executive committee member at PJR to ensure all of the audit requirements were fulfilled and a robust audit was conducted, as well as any unpaid balances paid the certificate draft issued and approved by the client all before a final certificate can ultimately be issued. If we schedule the audit too close to the transition deadline, it's possible those activities will not be completed before the overall deadline, which would constitute a lapse in certification or possibly even withdrawal. So again, Plan accordingly, work with your scheduler to identify when you would like to transition and make sure that we've allowed sufficient time for all of those activities to take place. 
Now we'll move into the key changes within the standard. <clears throat> And we'll go through these one at a time. This is not necessarily an all-inclusive list of the changes, nor is this a detailed review of the changes. I definitely encourage everyone to download the revisions, download a copy of the revised standard of, of the version 4.1 standard, as well as the sanctioned interpretations, and review them in detail. Reach out to myself or eStewards if you have any technical or interpretation questions, but certainly we can give you an overview of the changes today. So in no particular order, the key changes in eStewards version 4.1 as I have assessed them so far include acceptance of RIO certification in lieu of ISO 14001 certification as an eStewards prerequisite requirement or standard. Previously, the only required standard or accepted standard was ISO 14001, but RIOS will now be accepted as well. <clears throat> Revision of the definition of an eStewards processor. To clarify that control extends even to electronic equipment that is not processed or subject to processing. So this broadens the definition, clarifies this topic to address perhaps differences in interpretation or to increase the effective implementation of the intent of the requirement. Revision of the definition of problematic components or materials, also known as PCMs, to remove PVCs. And the reasoning for the removal was that it is an HEW and is already listed in the Basel Convention Annex. So this seemed redundant. Continuing on with the key changes, there's a new definition for a processing facility to include mobile processing, sampling, applicability to multi-sites, the impact on the requirements, and the impact of that multi-site change on the requirement for all relevant e-stewards organizations to achieve certification. So <clears throat> take a look at that processing facility definition and assess whether that impacts your business at all. Clarification of the requirements of section 6.1.3.1, transboundary movement in particular, is another key change. So the verbiage has been revised and the requirement clarified since the e-steward standard can't dictate that a material needs to be controlled if the governmental bodies in those regions don't feel the same. So in other words, the requirement was revised to make sure that the e-steward standard isn't including a requirement that conflicts or doesn't align with the governmental body decision. In regions where the waste is considered hazardous and prior informed consent proceedings are required, then obviously the e steward standard requires conformance to those requirements. However, in areas where prior informed consent is not required because the governmental body has not deemed that particular material to be hazardous or require control, then the prior informed consent process is not being superimposed by the e-steward standard. Another key change includes revisions to and expansions of the performance verification program criteria to be included. So things that need to be included in your performance verification program as the e-stewards certified facility. And that can be found in section 6.1.4. Take a look at that section and make any necessary revisions to your existing performance verification program to help with your version 4.1 transition. 
Section 8.5.1b reflects revised language in terms of the required documentation when we're talking about battery health, rechargeable battery health destined for reuse. So this change was made to align with another revision in version 4.1, a revision to the definition of repurposing. Although it's not significantly changed, sometimes changes have a ripple effect, so they revised the definition of repurposing as well as the requirement in 8.5.1b so they continue to be in agreement with one another. There is a new section, 8.5.1b3, to allow for the direct reuse of batteries without testing in really specific instances. So it would have to be a situation where the battery cannot be tested without presenting more significant risks and where the I, the criteria in that section are met. So you have to check all those boxes to fall into that category, but if you do, then that would be found in 8.5.1b3. <clears throat> There's another new section, 8.5.1.1. This focuses on repurposing. The change is in alignment with the revised definition for repurposing that we discussed a couple bullet points ago and also clarifies when repurposing can potentially constitute an acceptable form of reuse. So this has to be utilized in conjunction with both the eStewards functionality requirements and the transparency requirements found throughout the standard. Continuing on, key changes include clarification in section 8.5.2 regarding QSCs that will ultimately be tested by an IDP instead of the eSteward certified facility. There's clarification in section 8.6.1a as to <clears throat> the evidence expected to show approval was obtained to utilize a conditionally allowable option. So you need formal approval by the eStewards administrator to implement the conditionally allowable option. And that approval requirement was not clear in version 4.0. If this applies to you, if you utilize a conditionally allowable option or you plan to in the future, definitely take a closer look at 8.6.1a. Key changes also include revisions to the criteria in sections 8.8.21 and 8.8.2.3 for ensuring that non eSteward certified downstream processors maintain the criteria necessary to process or dispose of the materials of concern. This removes the requirement for all downstream processors in the recycling chain to have closure plans instead of just IDPs. So the changes here are twofold. It relates to the closure plan, plan <clears throat> and it also relates to the con confirmation or the evidence needed to show they can process the materials of concern according to the eStewards requirements. So you see those changes in both section 8.8.2.1 and 8.8.2.3 and those changes interrelate. And last but not least, two, two final changes. <clears throat> the there's additional verbiage in section 8.9 in regards to data security expectations. It also relates to NAID AAA certification transitions and more. And this is partially to clarify the requirement for eStewards organizations to, <clears throat> excuse me, to protect personal data, to, to secure the personal data when received even if the upstream or the customer claims it has been sanitized already. 
the exception to this would be instances where the customer owns the material and maintains that ownership throughout the entire processing. If this applies to your organization, if your clients maintain ownership throughout processing, then this wouldn't, this <clears throat> particular change would not apply to you. However, in general, these changes and the verbiage added relate to data security expectations in light of that impending NAID AAA certification deadline. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier in the presentation that there are two parts to the sanctioned interpretations required in conjunction with version 4.1. Section, sanctioned interpretation part A focuses primarily on the main body of the standard. So the changes there going into more detail as to what the change represents or why it was changed. And this includes the definitions and doesn't cover as much of the appendices. In some cases though, the changes do overlap and you can find that in part A of the sanctioned interpretations. Part B on the other hand, does focus primarily on the changes found within the appendices. Again, there is some overlap and that is not um, a black and white comparison. There are some changes found within the body of the standard located in section in sanctioned interpretation part B, but primarily they are focused on, on the different parts of the standard in that way, kind of broken down to make it a little bit easier to reference or find where you would interconnect those changes, where you can learn a bit more about those changes. <clears throat> I did want to note as well that Part B of the sanctioned interpretation focuses primarily on the change to allow Rios as a prerequisite. So you see several iterations of that in Part B of the sanctioned interpretation. Again, all of the changes that correlate to no longer only accepting ISO 14001 or requiring ISO 14001 specifically as now Rios would be acceptable instead. <clears throat> Just included briefly in the slides as promised is an overview of the registration process for clients who will be pursuing a new certification to version 4.1 rather than existing uh, certifications to be transitioned to version 4.1. So when pursuing a new registration or an initial certification, one of the first steps is to obtain a copy of the standard itself to get familiar with and have access to what the, <clears throat> excuse me, exact requirements are. It's important to establish the documentation to go uh, in conjunction with or to facilitate the requirements of the standard, conduct any training to the standard requirements. And when we see SMS here in the slides, it is the stewardship management system representative of the eStewards standard, the environmental health and safety, data security, and environmental stewardship concepts that it encompasses. So. The SMS is the stewardship management system. You want to conduct any training required by the standard and your documentation. Implement all of those requirements found within the documentation and the standard. And this includes conducting an internal audit, conducting a compliance evaluation, and conducting a full system review, a management system review, for example, that includes the outputs of those audits as inputs. So you'll need to conduct that full system review after the internal and compliance audits have been conducted so that the, the outputs or the results of those audits can be included in the discussion. The next steps will, to, will also include a contract with a certification body such as PGR to conduct those audits. Initial registrations are typically conducted as stage one and stage two audits. It's important to resolve any nonconformities, and that is required before a certificate can be issued. 
Specifically, the stage one audit is primarily a document review to make sure the framework to meet the standard is in place and that the client is ready to proceed to stage two. The stage two audit is a full system audit. All of the processes are sampled, all of the shifts to really get a good sense of how effectively the standard requirements have been implemented. Again, any nonconformities identified need to be resolved prior to certificate issuance. Certificates are good for three years. So once your certificate is issued, you enter the surveillance cycles for the two subsequent years. And those can be annual or semi-annual audits depending on your contract and preference. Shorter than stage two audits, those audits represent partial system audits. Again, those are the two subsequent years. Whereas the third year in the cycle, is the recertification audit similar to the stage two in that it's a full system audit and results in a new three-year cycle certificate once any nonconformities are resolved again earlier in the presentation i did mention that if you are recertifying or have an, having an initial registration to version 4.0 before that april 22nd deadline you would have a shorter certification cycle. So instead of getting three years, since you'll be due to transition, you'll see that sooner uh, April 2023 expiration date reflected to ensure that the transition occurs as required by the East Stewards Transition Plan. If you haven't already done so, please type any questions that you might have into the chat and I'm going to go to the final slide of my presentation which includes my contact information should you have any questions or want to discuss any of the changes further again you can reach out to myself or directly to East Stewards for clarification to that end my name is Austin Matthews I'm the EHS assistant program manager with PJR you can reach me by email or phone I've also included the number for the sales department should you be looking for a quote or some clarification as to how to get the process started. <clears throat> and again, a copy of today's slides and a recording of today's webinar will be made available, available on PGR's website after the responsible personnel return from vacation. Let's see if we have any questions. None yet, but it's possible someone is still typing, so I will hang out for another moment. And if there are no questions, thank you for joining us today. I highly encourage you to plan your transition audit in the very near future with your scheduler. Even if it's not taking place in the near future, you can still plan for when you anticipate transitioning, possibly even uh, tentatively scheduling those dates with the scheduler to hold our limited East Stewards auditor resources, um, hold that time on their calendars to help facilitate your transition and decrease the likelihood of a lapse in certification by planning ahead. I don't see any questions coming through, so thank you for joining us. Best of luck during your upcoming transition. I will offer this webinar again in the short term to help continue to prepare our East Stewards clients for transition and I'll update the content as we learn more and as we begin auditing the standard itself if there are additional um, points or lessons learned that I can share with you. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great day.